Okay, so after having dealt with propositional logic and predicate logic, I would now like to move on to a third and final um, logical system, or actually family of logical systems, namely modal logic. Modal logic is the logic that allows us to reason about modalities. And there are various modalities. The most important ones are probably necessity and possibility, but there's also obligation, permission, knowledge, belief, etc. But I'm going to focus on the elitic modalities, that is, necessity and possibility. Now, before we really get started, I should like to say that um, this lecture is probably going to be a bit more technical than the ones on propositional and predicate logic, but I think it's well worth the effort, because if you look at contemporary philosophy, then you see predicate logic being used a lot. That's not a lie, but probably modal logic is, even, um, is used even more extensively. It's used in various domains, metaphysics, value theory, epistemology, and so on. So I think it's definitely worth trying to grasp the ideas of modal logic. Um, first up, why do we need modal logic? And here I think a very similar story can be told as in the case of predicate logic. Namely, there are certain arguments that seem to be intuitively um, valid, but whose validity cannot be captured by um, any of the systems that we have introduced so far. So for example, consider the argument that goes as follows. It is necessary that God exists, therefore, God exists. Intuitively, this argument seems deductively valid. The conclusion is true, not true per se, I'm not making any claims about that, of course, but true given um, the premises. However, if we try to formalize this argument in propositional logic, again, we're going to have the same problem as um, when introducing predicate logic, namely, the argument is, will be formalized as P, therefore Q which of course is invalid, formally speaking. So this is a pretty bad formalization. And the reason for this is again, exactly that propositional logic cannot look inside the proposition. It cannot look inside the proposition, it is necessary that God exists, and see that this proposition actually consists of two parts. There's the sub-proposition, God exists, and then there's the modal operator, it is necessary that, which acts upon this proposition, so to speak. And modal logic is exactly what will, um, Will, will allow us exactly to look at this internal structure, okay? So modal logic is going to introduce two operators, two modal operators, namely the box operator and the diamond operator. The box operator stands for the modality of necessity, the diamond operator stands for possibility. Of course, there are also other interpretations where, for example, box could stand for obligation and diamond for permission, but again, we're not going to talk about those. So, if we have a sentence such as, it is necessary that Socrates is human, that will be formalized as box P. P stands for Socrates is human, and the necessity is being expressed by the box operator here. Similarly, it is possible that Socrates is human will be formalized as diamond P. Note, incidentally, that I am now simply, that I am now again um, formalizing the sentence Socrates is human by means of a single letter P. So I'm no longer focusing on the subject predicate structure of that sentence, of the subject Socrates and the predicate um, human. And the reason for that is what I am doing now is I'm doing modal propositional logic. If you want to focus simultaneously on the modal structure of a proposition and the subject predicate structure of a proposition, you can do that, but then you're doing modal predicate logic. What I am doing is modal propositional logic. That's already hard enough. Um, again, what we want to do is we don't simply want to formalize these sentences. We want to do something with them. We want to reason with them. And how you reason about a sentence or how you reason with sentences in modal logic is by means of Kripke models. Okay? The Kripke model is essentially um, an extension or a generalization of the idea of a truth table from um, propositional logic. A Kripke model consists of three components. First of all, there's a set W of possible worlds. Secondly, there's an accessibility relation R that is defined on that set. So that's the relation between possible worlds. And when two worlds, W1 and W2, stand in the relation, then we say that W2 is accessible from the possible world w, W1. Or more informally, that the possible world W1 sees the possible world W2. And then finally, the third component is the valuation V, which is going to specify which proposition letters are true at which possible worlds. Now, when students hear about possible worlds for the first time, 
they often get strange ideas about other galaxies, aliens, and other science fiction stuff. However, you should keep in mind that possible worlds are simply a philosophical device that allows us to attach a meaning to the modal operator, such as necessity and possibility, and to systematically reason about them. One can, of course, think about what possible worlds actually are, and people have actually done this in philosophy a lot, but I don't want to go into that right now. More important for us is that what possible worlds do is they allow us to reduce, so to speak, all talk about modalities to talk about quantifiers. How this exactly works will become clear in a minute. Now, the way I like to think of a Kripke model is simply by drawing a picture. So let's draw a Kripke model. First, we start by drawing our set of possible worlds. So let's say that we have five possible worlds, W1, W2, up to W5. The next thing we have to do is we have to specify the accessibility relation. So that's going to be a collection of arrows. For example, we can say that W1 sees the possible worlds W2 and W3 by drawing arrows from W1 to W2 and W3. We can also say that W2 sees itself and W4 and so on. Okay? And then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to specify the valuation. That is, we are going to say which proposition letters are true at which possible worlds. So suppose that there's only two letters, namely P and Q. One thing we could do is we could say, for example, that the letter P is true in the possible worlds W3 and W5, and the letter Q is going to be true in all possible worlds except for W3. Okay? So this is a full specification of a Kripke model. What we can now do is we can use this Kripke model to determine whether formulas, no matter how complex, are true at a certain possible world in this Kripke model. Okay? So the structure is a possible world is made true by, is true in a certain possible world of the Kripke model, which we will call M, typically. So first example, can we say that the formula Q is true at W1? Well, sure, we can read that off. Q is true because it's made true by the valuation. So that's simple. But we can also ask, is Q necessarily true at W1? Okay? In other words, is the formula box Q, necessary Q, true at W1? Now, modal logic says that for a formula of the form box Q to be true at a certain possible world W1, it has to be the case that the formula without the box, namely Q, has to be true in all possible worlds that are seen from W1, that are accessible from um, W1. So in this particular model, if you look at the arrows, then we see that W1 sees W2 and W3. So for box Q to be true at W1, it should be the case that Q is true at both W2 and W3. But unfortunately, we see that while it's true at W2, it is not true at W3. So in total, we cannot say that Q is necessarily true at W1. The formula box Q um, is not true at W1. However, this same formula is true at another possible world in the model, namely W2. Because W2, if you look at the worlds seen by W2, that is W2 itself, but also W4, in both of these, Q is true. So we're going to say that box Q is true at W2. Let's now have a look at the worlds W1 and W3, because these are the possible worlds that are seen from W4. In W1, Q is true, but P is false, while in W3, it's exactly the other way around. P is true, but Q is false. Now, if you think a bit about this, um, given that these two worlds are seen from W4, what I just said is going to imply that neither the formula box P nor the formula box Q is going to be true at W4. Okay? However, what is necessarily true at W4 is their disjunction. The formula box, P or Q, is true at W4. After all, the, the disjunction P or Q is true at W1, because the second disjunct is true there. And it's also true at W3, because the first uh, disjunct, P, is true there. So in total, it's true in both of the possible worlds, in all of the possible worlds seen by W4. So the disjunct disjunction is necessarily true. Its boxed version is true at W4. And then finally, I would like to um, convince you that you can really go on and on with this. For example, you can ask about the, about the formula box, box, P or Q. It is necessary that it is necessary that P or Q. Is this true 
at W2. Well, what you should check for this is whether the formula with the first box stripped off, that is box P or Q, you have to check whether this formula is true at all the possible worlds that are seen by W2. In this case, is this formula true at W2 and W4? We already checked previous exercise that it is true in W4. It's also a pretty easy exercise to check that it's also true at W2 itself. So box P or Q is true in all possible worlds that are seen by W2. So box box P or Q is gonna be true at W2 itself. Now what I like a lot about Kripke models, why Kripke models are so incredibly useful in philosophy, is that the accessibility relation of a Kripke model, you can basically think of it as a knob on a radio. You can turn the knob, and depending where you turn the knob, you're gonna hear music from channel one, or music from channel two, or perhaps just noise. So the idea is that there are various philosophical principles that we can um, inquire about having to do with necessity and possibility. One typical example would be the principle that necessity entails truth. If something is necessarily true, then it's actually true. Or another example would be, if something is necessarily true, then it's necessary that it's necessarily true. And it turns out that all of these principles, these philosophical principles about the modalities, um, correspond in a mathematically precise sense to properties that we can impose on the accessibility relation. For example, you can show that um, this idea of necessity entailing truth corresponds to the requirement that the accessibility relation is reflexive. That is, there should be loops. Every world can see any world it likes, but it should at least see itself, so there should be a loop. So that means that the model that we just saw would not be a good model um, when we wanna accept the principle that necessity entails truth. Because in this model, although one world could see itself, it was not the case that all worlds could see themselves. So this is really one of the main reasons why modal logic is so incredibly useful in philosophy. Saul Kripke is actually a very famous um, philosopher and logician. Um, in philosophy, he's famous in philosophy of language, um, for example, because of his book Naming and Necessity, but also his um, interpretation of Wittgenstein. Um, but what I think is um, the biggest importance of Kripke is, is of course, in modal logic. Um, so um, we have Kripke models in modal logic, but also one of the most important systems of modal logic is called K after Saul Kripke. Uh, the funny thing is actually that there's a lot of um, stories, a lot of, a lot of myths about Kripke. Some of them are true, some of them probably false, and I don't know which one are true, which one are false, of course. The most famous story is probably the one that involves Richard Montague at UCLA. And here's how the story goes. Um, by the end of the 1950s, a lot of people, a lot of um, logicians had been struggling to find the semantics for modal logic. And um, one of them was the logician Richard Montague, who was working at a very famous um, university in the United States, UCLA, where he ran a weekly seminar together with the best and brightest of his graduate students. And every week they would gather and try to solve the problem of coming up with the semantics for modal logic. But then one week he would um, enter the seminar room and he would tell to his students, um, gentlemen, we can all go home because the problem that we have been trying to solve for the past couple of months has now been solved by a 70-year-old high school kid from Omaha, Nebraska. So this uh, very abstract idea of a Kripke model, uh, or what we now call a Kripke model for modal logic, was actually developed by a 17-year-old uh, high school kid from Nebraska. And that's uh, pretty intriguing, I think. So this Saul Kripke, he's one, well, he's a pretty crazy guy.